Hi, Leila. Thanks Hi. so much for coming onto my podcast. And we're going to do a, this is going to be a pretty sufficient, long four-parter. And thanks for doing this with me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I have specific reasons in which I wanted you to come and do this, but I really wanted to talk about um, children with extreme abilities that almost suffer. They, they suffer more than um, in the beginning parts of learning their abilities and later on too, if they haven't been dealt with. So I felt that was a huge part. It, and we get to talk about a whole lot of aspects of growing up with having such extreme abilities and then how it led to your work. Can you give my listeners an idea of what type of work you do? So I am a certified healing touch practitioner, which is a form of energy medicine. Um, and it is a form of energy medicine that is practiced and accepted um, in the Holistic Nurses Association as well as in hospitals. Um, and you can practice it at the bedside. My specialty though is working with children that have chronic pain and or symptoms that have yet to be defined from intuitive abilities. Um, and that's because um, I was an intuitive child and am now an intuitive adult and I know what challenges um, lie in store for someone growing up with extreme abilities. So could you specify, because I think we all kind of get tripped up on verbiage, what the difference between being psychic and then intuitive is? So to me, intuitive is the ability to sense and feel, and that can be related to time. So that can be future or past in the current moment. That can be other people, that can be yourself, that can be dimensions, vibrations. Um, intuitive means feeling. Psychic is, is more the ability to see. Um, when you're, the easiest way to explain that is when you're dealing with time and a psychic looks into the future, they don't necessarily sense the 10,000 possibilities. What they see is the most probable. So out of, I don't know, 7,000 out of those 10,000, it's most likely you're going to get up and put that blue top on. And then that's what they'll relay to you. Whereas an intuit, they can sense and feel 10,000 timelines and go, okay, well, if you want to move this way, here's what you need to do to get that direction or get on that particular timeline. Um, so what I would say is intuit is more feeling, sensing. Psychic is more seeing, but not in the traditional sense of seeing. Okay. All right. So we're going to start because we have a long, uh, a lot we want to cover and I want to start just at the beginning with, um, we can start at the beginning with your childhood. If, would you like to start at the beginning before your childhood? Sure. Uh, so, wherever you want to go. <laughs> so I have, um, I have a couple memories before I was born that I just came in with. Um, but I think the two that are most pertinent to our conversation today was I um, met both my parents before I was born. Um, my mother I met when she was in college. I have a memory of going to visit her um, and she was playing at the piano and I was standing at the piano desperately trying to get her attention and in my mind I needed her to wake up. I needed her to like it was almost like if she was like sleeping or zoned out and I needed her to wake up. Um, when I told my mom that memory my mom in real life has a very specific memory where she was playing at the piano and um, stuff was taken off the piano and thrown across the room. So we're guessing that the memory of me going in and trying to get her attention is that memory um, that she actually has. With my dad, I met him when he was older and I, was with my sister, I could see my sister, I have a memory of being with my sister, and we told him at his work, though we didn't know it was his work, um, we told him one day that we were coming, we told him what our names were, and we told him that our mom, my mom, was definitely the woman he was supposed to be with, and he needed to be with her. 
Um, and when I described this memory to uh, my parents, they recognized that as the break room where they both worked. Um, and then in, in terms of my birth, do you want me to go on into what happened leading up to my birth? My mother's mother had passed. Um, I'm not sure how, how much prior to my birth she had passed, but she was coming to my mom in dreams regularly. And um, she told my mom that she was going to be pregnant and gave her the date. And then in the dream, she handed me over to my mom, like a little baby handed me over and my mom was holding me. So when she got up and she went to work that day, at the time, her and my father were broken up. They were not together. And my mom didn't see them getting back together. And she went into work and she was discussing with a friend this dream. And they sat there and figured out the math in order for me to be born on this particular day, when would she have to get pregnant? And they figured out it would have to happen within a couple weeks after she had this dream. So my mom was like, well, that's impossible. That's not gonna happen. And within a couple of weeks of having this dream, she left work one day, went home, and uh, just suddenly her dog crawled up in her lap and just died. Um, she had no warning, no nothing. And um, she was devastated. She was out kind of in the middle of nowhere. She was out on a farm, farmland all by herself. So she called her best friend, the best friend um, couldn't get to her. And so the best friend ended up calling my dad and said, you need to get over to, to my mom and, and help her out. Um, her name's Trish, by the way, you need to get over to Trish and help her out because she's got this huge German shepherd, she's devastated. And, um, and that's the story of my birth. And I was born on the day that uh, she was told in her dream uh, my father knew my name. He picked out my name. They're guessing, my mom's guessing, my father never told her, but when she found out she was pregnant, they still weren't officially together, back together. And so she kind of said to my dad, you need to decide what you're doing. And when he left to think about everything, she kind of was under the impression he was gonna choose to not be present um as a father and within a couple of days all of a sudden he like completely turned around and was totally devoted and figuring out what he needed to do to move there to be present with her through the pregnancy and so um, my father unfortunately has passed but we're guessing that when when my sister and i visited him in the break room my mom thinks it was in that that moment where she told him you really need to think about what you're going to do because his attitude just so drastically changed um but we're really not sure when that memory was um for me and my sister but my father was the one that picked our names and we told him in the memory what our names should be you guys were laying it out right yes. <laughs> you're making sure things went to plan yep <laughs> And so then how does this lead into your childhood and whether or not you had these, these abilities when you started to, I mean, how does this lead into your childhood and where does it lead you as in you start realizing your own abilities or you didn't realize them at a young age? So my mom and my dad definitely knew, at least with me, um, I was very vocal, not outside of the house, but very vocal with my parents um, in terms of like, you know, what I came in knowing. Um, I would often tell them about God and like why I was here and what I was supposed to be doing. And, um, you know, one of my mom's favorite stories is like, you know, when one time I got lost in the bus system, we lived I think I said this out on a farm. So there wasn't a lot of, um, but it wasn't easy to get from where we were living to school. And so it was really tricky um, commuting. And she, I never arrived home one day and she was very upset. And when they finally got me to the house hours later, 
I got off the bus and as she described it was so calm and just said to her, I don't, I don't know why you're worried because obviously God's going to take care of me. Like this is what was supposed to happen today. And she was like on the verge of like a panic attack. So I was vocal in that way. Um, I don't think that I really registered that I was different until um, around seven or eight. Um, we used to have a game, me and my sister and a neighbor boy, where we would kind of like create an obstacle course in the woods behind the house. And you had like certain movements you had to do and a certain rhythm you had to do it all in and you would end up at this huge pine tree, a real pine tree. And um, me and my sister would sit underneath this pine tree. There were logs underneath of it. And we'd sit underneath the pine tree. The neighbor boy would stay on the outside. And one by one, he would let people in to talk to us. Um, I, as a child, never thought that was weird. <laughs> I just really genuinely thought there were people out in the woods in the field waiting to talk to me and my sister. So. We would do this, I don't know, like a couple times a month or a couple times, you know, once or twice a month. I'm not really sure how often, but it was pretty regular. And when I actually registered this is different actually happened in one of these games because my grandfather actually showed up and I had enough, I guess, critical thinking to know my grandfather lived really far away and there's no way he would show up um, without my mom telling us that he was on his way. It took, it was a very long car ride to get to him. Um, and that's the first time that I can really consciously, like I felt it like a wave coming over my body, like the realization that I wasn't just playing make believe and this wasn't normal. Um, it's the first time I felt fear in relation to my abilities. Um, and I, in a lot of ways, kind of panicked when I saw him. Um, and it kind of screwed up the game a little bit. And, and, um, and sure enough, when we came running home after I saw my grandfather, um, he had passed. Um, and my mom had just gotten the phone call that her father had passed. Is that a huge weight on you to, you know, to understand that? Is that? I don't really remember if it was a huge weight. Now I know when I was older and I knew relatives were going to pass, that was a huge weight when I got around like my preteens. What I remember registering was this overcoming fear and panic that what we were doing wasn't normal. It wasn't right. Um, and I remember it literally like coming over me and then watching my sister slowly realizing as well. So like it just like that fear, we had never felt fear like that before. We had never questioned what we were doing. And even, you know, think about a child playing, like you just, you just are, you're just doing it. And it was the first time that I was like, Oh, this is, this isn't right. This isn't normal. Um, but I don't remember it necessarily being a weight at that age kind of sad though in its own right because that's for me that would like be one of the huge milestones where you're moving away from the ease of childhood and seeing you know what I mean like really it's almost like a giant like you went through a door and the door closed behind you yep. like that's over yeah you know because I mean we see it with our own kids uh you know I'm watching a little bit with Eve now where she's going to be seven tomorrow and and she's walking into that space where you know the critical thinking kicks in and mm -hmm. comparison kicks in and it's just not like the ease and play of childhood anymore it's, yeah yeah it's scary and sad but for you it almost felt like immediate you know yeah it did and after that it was to me very um, very traumatic after that because I was always registering this is not right this is not weird why why won't it stop and of course it didn't stop what happened was all these beings or these spirits that were coming to talk to us out in the woods when we stopped showing up 
they started finding their way to the house. Um, and then I was dealing with a whole nother issue. You know, I would wake up and could see them outside the window or knocking on the window, trying to figure out how to get in to be able to talk to me and my sister. Like it was a whole nother ball game, if you will. Um, but prior to that, I don't remember it ever scaring me. Like I know for sure, um, which I know is something that you and I wanted to talk about is a lot of my learning came from the spiritual. Um, so even though I was going to school, I don't want to say that school was not important to me. Um, but I, like my numbers, my ABCs, I have a distinct memory of a spirit following me around in the yard, teaching me how to count and teaching me the ABCs. And that's what registered with me. I was functioning more in the spiritual than I was the physical. So how I was learning was through, through the spiritual. I was not really learning through the physical. I, just because I think there's going to be people who are not are going to ask when you say registering are you being more in the spiritual than in the physical could you explain what that means so it took me a long time to be able to express that and understand that um so that's more in hindsight now but for me it was almost like I was living in an alternate reality in some ways. Like it would be like me and you talking and I'm thinking that I'm talking and hearing you here now, but really who I'm talking to is your spirit and everything your soul is. And so I functioned more in the energetic or the spiritual world. And I was seeing it all the time and experiencing it all the time. And I thought it was normal. Um, and then as I get older and older and older, I start realizing either I'm crazy or I'm not normal. Um, and that's just how I was. It's just how I came in. Uh, for my sister, hers kind of naturally, she still has abilities, but hers kind of naturally closed down. I never had that advantage, no matter what I did and no matter what I tried, I could not shut down my abilities without um, without sacrificing my health in some way. It was so, I guess, important, but also, you know, um, part of who I was to shut them down was a huge sacrifice to my system. So to be in the physical then would be to be for so for clarity for others and please tell me if i'm getting this wrong to be in the physical is to be like here in this human dimension like what we're doing here in the human like um your life here but there's also other parts of you in other timelines or dimensions and i'm guessing there's a physical aspect in that for that for that moment but when we're talking about physical, we're talking in this moment, like you listening to this podcast and being in your car right now, driving right. around. Right. And that didn't exist for me. Um, a good, another good example would be, um, I didn't realize until like uh, my teens or my 20s, I couldn't describe what anyone looked like. I was totally basing my description of people on how I felt, um, what it was like to be in their presence. Um, you know, how I was registering their spirit, I, it took me, it was genuinely a skill I had to learn to be able to say this person has brown hair, this person has blue eyes, this person, it was like, it just naturally was not there for me. I was registering who they were and what they felt like from an energy or a spiritual point of view. So when you, so this moment happens for you with your grandfather what happens from then? How do things change? You know, I know you told me the spirit started to make their way up to the house and whatnot, but I'm only going by this because um, at nine, eight, nine things, I noticed instead of pittering off, you know, which I, you know, I kind of, not that things kind of closed down, but things calmed down for Eve at five, six. And with Dominic, they always just seem to be escalating, escalating, escalating. It never 
It never, uh, and then new, his abilities seem to evolve and grow. So we would have new aspects of his abilities, which we had to contend with. So now this moment has happened with your grandfather and things start to escalate for you. How does, what does that look like? Well, I think they were always escalating really, but the, and, and I'm closer to Dominic. Like I said, I could never shut it down. Um, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and more and more overwhelming and, you know, and seeing more and more and trying to understand more and more, experiencing more and more. But the big thing that shifted with my grandfather is I suddenly, I had the sudden awareness that there's fear associated to it, that it's different, that it's not right, um, and that this isn't just make believe. There's also a realness to it, because how would I know my grandfather had passed? Um, and it kind of sent everything home in a totally different way. So really what changed was my um, cognitive awareness of everything. Before I was just being and just doing whatever I naturally felt. And then from then on, it's like kind of a tug of war between who I naturally am and who I think I should be. Um, and that was also escalating and escalating and escalating. So uh, what, could you give me some, okay. Actually, I'm going to reword that whole thing. Did your parents start to, what age, I know you had said with the bus that your mom started to really notice, is what age were you then? That was around the same age, but from a very young age, my mom noticed, I, I'm assuming my dad too, but they both noticed that I was easily overwhelmed by people, by sounds, by lights, um, by smells. Um, I think in that time of my life, it was really a blessing that we did live out in farmland because I could be in nature to reset and I didn't have neighbors up on top of me and lots of movement with cars and stuff. But even when I was little and we tried to do, or I tried to do preschool, every time I left preschool, I was leaving in a complete anxiety attack. Um, and so they had to totally rethink how they were going to school me and what they were going to do because I was so easily overwhelmed by everything. And to me, I can remember distinctly, especially at school, as the day would progress, the anxiety and the stress for me was just getting to a rate that was unbelievable that I felt like by the end of every school day, I was feeling sick. Um, and felt like, you know, I was going to throw up and headachy and, and just not feeling right at all. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about school then, because this would seem wildly overwhelming. What, what did school life look like for you as you went in with your childhood? So when I first started school, preschool, kindergarten, um, right up till first grade, the way our county worked, um, where I had to go to school was hooked onto a high school. Um, and so to go to school wasn't just with other preschoolers. You had to walk through and there were high school students. There were all kinds of students moving. So by first grade, my parents made the decision to move me out to a private Catholic school um, that only had a classroom of, I think at the most we had 14 students. And that is where I stayed until we moved when I was 10 years old. Um, the first year was really tough. And every time we had to change a classroom, it was really tough. But I think because I stayed with the same students, I could manage the anxiety much better. Um, and they also were very um, proactive in, in my health. So they also took me to doctors. And I was diagnosed with high anxiety and OCD when I was little. When you, so we probably should address the religion question. Were you moved to a Catholic school because your family was religious or just because it was a smaller class? Smaller class. It was a smaller class. I mean, my mom and my dad are very spiritual. My dad, he had more of a Celtic Irish spirituality. My mom had uh, Christianity, 
um, and um, believes in God, but it, that's not why we moved there. We moved there to manage my anxiety and to get me in a position where I could still go to school and function. So how was moving for you, unless you have more you want to talk about, about your life on the farm? Land. The only thing that I would just like to add, because we touched on it, is um, the OCD and the anxiety was purely from my abilities. Um, there's not a doubt in my mind. The OCD, um, where they noticed the OCD and the doctor diagnosed it was me constantly checking the locks and making sure the doors were locked, the windows were locked. That's because every night I'm waking up and I'm seeing a hundred and some beings standing outside the house trying to get my attention. Um, so. I can say for sure as a child, my anxiety and OCD was totally related to that. Now, as a child, I couldn't express all of that. I'm struggling to tell my mom that there's all these things outside and she's doing her best to help me out. Um, but as a child, those were, those were symptoms of having to deal with my abilities. Uh, what else OCD wise did, did you do? I'm only, I think we've kind of chatted about this before. I know with Dominic and food has always been an issue, but what I always found wildly interesting was if I put something down in front of him that, and he would look at it or smell it once. And he would say, they changed the ingredients in here something has changed. And then I would go look at the packet. And sure enough, if I had two of the same thing, two of the same boxes, sure enough, they could, they had changed it or, um, you know, just wanting to go in a certain way, you know, obviously we have the door opening and shutting things. If he goes in a room, he shuts all the doors. Um, and is there any other OCD things that you did that you can think of? I would go through periods of constantly having to wash. I still do that, um, depending on what vibration or energy that I'm dealing with or is dealing with me. Um, I would go through phases where I, I had to shower every night before bed. I had to wash my hands a zillion times. Um, now as an adult, I'm aware of what's happening, but as a child, I didn't understand it. And they would come through as phases. I definitely had, um, issues with food, smells, houses, like I could tell if something changed, if we had workers come in the house, um, I would be totally, you know, weirded out by certain smells, and I would complain that they, you know, changed the house and changed it in some way. Um, my poor mom and dad. <laughs> but no, I can I relate with this a thousand percent. <laughs> Um, I used to hear tones in the TV. I actually still hear that too. There's tones that come out of the TV. They shift and change. Um, so, you know, some basic things I couldn't even do because I was hearing things other people couldn't hear. Every being has a tone or a, you know, a vibration to it. So you can hear all of that. Um, and so, and it all came in phases. I also went through phases where I couldn't eat certain things. As an adult now, having studied holistic healing, I know there are certain vibrations where you can't have any milk products. You can't have, you know, meat. You can't have, you know, certain things that your, your system will reject when you're dealing with certain vibrations. But as a child, I didn't know that. So, of course, I would oddly go through these phases where I'm allergic to milk. I'm vomiting or I'm getting rashes and then it would just disappear and I could drink milk and I'd be fine. Like I was co like constantly shifting and changing and my mom and dad had to work so hard to keep up with me. Oh, uh, yes. They're working very hard to keep up with you. Yes. Well, it's just a con for us on our end, it's um, a constant switching of lanes. Right. That is very difficult to do because one, one way you're, just trying to do life and laundry over here. And then um, I know for me, Dominic will run in and throw down some truth about what he's seeing or experiencing. And my brain wasn't there. My brain was worried about I'm not putting colors in the whites. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I was known for doing that too. Yeah. With, and sometimes with my parents specifically, like I would just lay out a truth for them and then be like, all right, see ya. I'm just going to, 
<laughs> go on and do go back to playing outside and they're left there for a couple hours going what the heck <laughs> yep so you move and you move to delaware yep. and what how does that I mean, that talks about you not being able to control your space. I mean, you're moving houses. How is that in its own? So we actually, uh, we actually had some issues moving. So we actually moved to New Jersey, was there less than six months because I was such a mess and my parents didn't like where we were and then moved to Delaware. So by the time we got to Delaware, I was kind of freaking out a little bit. Um, I always feel very deeply. I always um, care very deeply. So me having to leave all my friends, leave my comfort, leave my house was a very, very painful thing for me. Um, we had a period where we couldn't sell the house right away. So whenever my dad would go up to check on the house or work on the house, I'd oftentimes would go with him and then just sit in this empty house, like totally grieving that I was leaving, even though as a child, I don't fully understand what's happening. Um, and where we moved in Delaware, it, the school systems and everything was completely different. So in this scenario, um, I didn't really have a choice in terms of schooling. So um, I had to go to public school. Um, and so I went from having 14 students in a class to having hundreds um, in a public school in Center City. Um, and so that's the biggest thing that I can remember. Um, and it was totally traumatic for my system in many, many ways. Um, and I think it would have been traumatic for any child, but then when you add having all these intuitive abilities on top of it, it made it even more difficult and challenging. Just bogging you down and having to register. Uh, yeah, because what you're, when you're an empath, even if you just even have basic empath abilities, if you're in a room of 12 people, you don't realize it, but what you're doing is on some level, you're constantly monitoring those 12 people's emotions, their energy, what they're experiencing. If you can see timelines and dimensions, you're monitoring more parts than just their physical self constantly. Um, so now imagine going from sitting in a room with 12 people for eight hours, and now you're going into a building where you have to switch classrooms with hundreds of kids, you know, for eight hours or however long you're there. Um, it's exhausting and extremely, extremely overwhelming. And I was never in the position where I could just shut it down. I couldn't do that. Um, it was constantly coming in. It was coming in at such a rate. It was hard for me to even fathom or understand what was happening. So what, what ends up happening? How does, do the, we remedy that or do you end up just staying and struggling? Um, I tried really hard to make it work. Um, the position we were in as a family, I really needed to try to make it work. Um, but it was getting to a point where now my health was starting to decline. I started having migraines that couldn't be explained. I started having symptoms that couldn't be explained. Um, my anxiety was through the roof. Um, but what I remember hitting me the hardest and when I started really begging my mom to find another way for me, um, and I didn't feel like I was going to make it is that I did not know because I came from a small school with 14 students that you could not be friends with everyone. And so very quickly, I'm trying to make friends with Every single person I meet, I'm trying to be nice and open. And I didn't know anything about clicks. And what ended up happening is I ended up getting bullied pretty, pretty early on and harassed. And, um, and I didn't understand it. Like I legitimately couldn't understand why, why they were choosing to harass me and bully me. And to me, that registered so deeply because 
I could, I'm sitting here, you know, it's a very complicated thing, right? What they're doing is not right. But at the same time, my brain is registering what they're experiencing at home and why they're doing it and what's fueling them to make these choices. And all I feel is deep empathy because I can see these backgrounds and, you know, they're totally being dictated and controlled in a way that they aren't even aware of. And so it was so, um, hard to experience, to feel deep love for someone and at the same time have them um, hurting me. And I couldn't, I couldn't justify it in my little preteen brain. Um, so I really started begging to be taken out of school. They temporarily tried a Catholic school that was nearby, but if still, you know, a classroom of 35 students, and I still struggled with that. Um, and so in the end, Thankfully, uh, my mom made the decision um, to homeschool me, and I remained homeschooled right up until college. What do you mean by when you were saying that you weren't going to make it? I really felt like um, I really felt like physically I wasn't going to make it. There's been a couple times in my life where I have felt like that, like either I was going to find trouble to the point that you know, something would happen to me or I just wouldn't be able to make it. I wouldn't be able to take it. And in my teenage years, I started really struggling with depression. Um, and it, for many reasons between the move and losing my security, but also dealing with all these abilities and not being able to express it and talk about it. Um, but also just feeling I think in hindsight, some of it was just feeling the dynamics of the family. We lost multiple relatives, so both my parents were grieving. My father was grieving the farmland. He definitely was someone that needed to be on the land and now no longer had the opportunity to do that. Um, and I'm feeling all of that as if it's happening to me and I can't separate. I can't tell the difference. I was just wondering that, not because I'm trying to make this about me, but um, it just reminds me of uh, when Dominic just didn't believe, you know, he's getting suicidal at five and he just, he just said, I can't make it. I won't make it. And, or he'd say, I just want to go home or it's just, it's just easy. It's not, it's too hard here. Yeah. Um, I said very similar things and even, um, I would say even well up into my 20s, when I'd have a really, really, really bad day, that's what I would say to myself. I just want to go home. I'm so tired. I want to go home. Um, and I don't understand why I'm here. Nothing is working. Things aren't moving the way that they should be. Um, so I can, I understand that. Yeah. And by home, he doesn't mean, he, you know, he's in no. his house. No. He <laughs> has been in since a baby. It's not this home. Right. Right. Yeah. So you start to homeschool and how does that change things for you? So homeschooling was definitely the best option for me, both physically and spiritually, because we could kind of work with my schedule. Um, so if I had, you know, a night where I couldn't sleep, we could compensate for it and I could sleep in during the day. I also got to explore the subjects I was most interested in. So I feel like for me, my learning increased tenfold, whereas before I was really struggling, now I was kind of in my element. And I think that kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier is what I learned from or what I learned from when I was younger were things that had spiritual significance to me. They had to be resonating in the spiritual. Well, when you're homeschooled, you can kind of cater, you can get history by, you know, different topics. You don't have to do the speed roll through different things. As you know, you can cater to what the person's interested in. So I feel like my learning and my excitement for learning definitely opened up. Um, but I also feel like my spiritual abilities opened up. Even though they were escalating, I feel like when I was home, I wasn't exhausted now from dealing with hundreds of kids um, and slowly but surely my abilities started increasing because I had less distractions now. Um, and that kind of became 
a major stressor and focal point for me in my preteens because I wasn't going out into the world every day. It was just me and my space and my select few neighbor friends. And so there was a great emphasis. My dreams increased. Um, I was seeing stuff in the house all the time. Um, we were having experiences in the house regularly. Um, you know, so everything increased. My depression also increased. I think it was kind of like, I think all the trauma of moving and school had kind of built up. Um, and then, like I said, I was feeling everyone else's grief. I was going through my own grief. And that I can say that level of depression, anxiety, some of it was my abilities, but a lot of it was just, I couldn't physically cope with everything that was happening on a daily basis. Um, so I started therapy and being homeschooled, um, we could fit in different therapies in a much easier way. So that was the other benefit, doctor's appointments and therapists, you can fit in a lot easier when you're homeschooled. Do you feel like those doctor's appointments and therapists were of help to you? Um, I found one therapist that I absolutely adored and I still am very grateful for him. For him, it was less about whether I was crazy or true. He didn't care if I shared dreams. He didn't care any of, about any of that. What he cared about is did I have the coping mechanisms to get through the day? Um, and he was very open to what we would call now is like expressive therapy or art therapy. At that time, I don't think that was well known. Um, so a lot of times he used art and play to be able to give me coping mechanisms. Um, I despised my psychiatrist. I didn't think he really cared about me. It was always a very rushed appointment. I felt very uncomfortable with him. Um, and I was on medicine. I guess I should say that I was on medicine for depression and um, insomnia in my preteens. Do you feel like, actually, let me ask this question first. Were you also, did your parents take you in to get like evaluated for, you know, psych and yeah, we had that. And then we, they also did CAT scans and MRIs because I would have weird symptoms. Like I would go through these bouts of weird symptoms. Like I remember going in my preteens, I remember light affecting me so greatly that my one eye I couldn't see out of, and I'd go through bouts of migraines. Um, but they really struggled to find any type of diagnosis. And a lot of times it was attributed to either, you know, like vitamin deficiencies or growing pains. Um, so they were pretty regular and on top of taking me to doctors. I had um, a psych evaluation. I obviously had to have one to go to a psychiatrist and a therapist. Um, and so none of that was totally foreign or out of nowhere to me. And I can even remember doing that as a child because of my anxiety being through the roof. Um, I never shared with doctors. I shared a couple dreams with thera my therapist. Um, I don't know if I shared with my psychiatrist, um, but I never shared any of that with the doctors. Um, I don't know if my mom told me not to, or I just intuitively knew that stays separate. And how did you feel within your own family? Like, did, were you able to confide in them and your parents or your sister? Or, I mean, I assumed you know, at least in the younger years, you had your sister. So I feel like out of everyone, my sister was the most supportive when we were younger. Um, she, she wouldn't make fun of me or anything like that. And uh, we slept in the same room. We would, what we would do is flip-flop rooms. So like I would sleep on the bed, she'd sleep on the floor, and then I'd move down to her bedroom and sleep on the floor and she'd sleep in the bed. Um, so we slept in the same room well up until my preteens. Um, and that was because she would get freaked out or I would get freaked out. And then if we both got freaked out, we'd move into our parents' rooms. Um, so in that sense, she was definitely my main support. My mom always let me share everything. She encouraged me to journal, um, but she never really 
it wasn't until my young adult years, she never really shared any of her experiences. Um, so as far as I was concerned, I was kind of on my own. And then my dad was the complete opposite. My dad really just kind of wanted to shut it down completely. I mean, he wouldn't get nasty with me about it, but like I totally got the impression and the vibe from him is like, we just, we're not gonna talk about it. Um, and I know like a couple times I would say things to him and he'd just kind of like nod his head and that was the extent of the conversation. How was it like with activity in the house where, you know, it's something that could not be ignored? That, that always like blows my mind, you know, when there's activity going on and, you know, it's amazing to me humans can like change the perception of what it is. Yep. But how was that for you? Um, so my sister was right there with me anytime something happened and we'd both start screaming or freaking out. So <laughs> my sister was definitely, she didn't deny any of it. Um, and she also, she was way more outgoing than me. I was very, very introverted. I didn't talk to a lot of people. Um, I didn't go out a lot. Um, having neighborhood kids helped me a little bit and I would go out and play with them, but I was extremely introverted. So she was the more extroverted one and she would just tell people, um, we got ghosts in the house. Or, Let me tell you a ghost story. You know, when we were younger, she was much more extroverted. Um, my father was totally the parent that you're talking about. Um, he was totally the one that said, would say it didn't happen. Just ignore it. Keep going. Um, you know, I can remember blatantly, this is like a cute story that we always share um, amongst each other in the family. I remember blatantly one night we had put the dog out and the dog was outside and the dog went, wanted in. Um, and it was always like kind of, you know, it's the end of the night, right? So my dad would always, you know, tell me or my sister to let the dog in. And it was always a fight who let the dog in because no one wanted to get up and let the dog in. And it was, we were sitting there and clear as day, we heard this voice say, hey, let me in. I need to come in. And I remember me and my sister looking at each other. We're looking at my dad. My dad's looking at us. And, um, and the dog's looking in the window. <laughs> We're all trying to figure out where the voice came from. And I remember saying to my dad, you heard that, right? And he just kind of looked at me and was like, you better let the damn dog in. <laughs> like, that's what he said. <laughs> but then after that, when we try to bring it up and we try to share it with my mom, he'd be like, no, no, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. It, or um, when we got older, he said to my sister, oh, I did that. I did that. But I remember his face. I remember going through it. Um, my mom would acknowledge it, but then she would say to me, you know, just stay calm. Like, we're going to pretend it, it, we're just going to keep going. It wasn't like, um, it wasn't the same vibe. Like, my dad was pretend it didn't happen, ignore it completely. My mom was like, we need to stay calm and okay, it happened, but we're not going to ruminate on it or dwell on it because we're trying to keep this house as calm as possible. I have a question because we experienced them here and we've kind of chatted about this is when things come in, I call them and I can tell they're affecting Dominic. Um, I mean, we've talked about this. I don't know whether to call them an attack or something that's going on within him. Did that happen for you? I mean, or does it still happen for you? And what do you clarify as an attack or what do you clarify as something that's going on within you? So, so it took a long time to be able to discern that. So I definitely would have what I know you to consider an attack where I'm having these emotions and these thoughts that are totally foreign to me, they come over me and it's not like they come through and they're gone. It's like I'm living them, experiencing them right there in that moment. So I'll burst into tears. And then when my parents are asking me what I'm crying about, I'm crying about 
some stranger in 1942 that had to go through this experience, you know, if I can even get that out. Um, I'd go through, like I said, really weird bouts of like, you know, I can't move, you know, I can't walk, I'm too heavy, you know, or I feel like there's something on my shoulders and now my shoulders hurt and I can't possibly move three inches to the couch. Like, um, as I got older, I started being able to discern and it, unfortunately it happened very late for me. So I was in college by the time I started to put together that there was inner and then there was outer. So now as an adult, what I consider an attack to be is if something outside of me is trying to change or get my attention. So they're adjusting my energy field and my body, um, which happens when you have abilities. Um, and I think we've talked about that. Like you're kind of like a big lighthouse of energy and they don't know that you're a nine-year-old child or a 14-year-old girl you know like they have no idea they just see the energy and they're trying to talk to that energy they're trying to talk to that light um so that's what I consider an attack now and then I have inner which can affect my body just as greatly and I have all these different parts of me that I'm very aware of um, that has to do with timelines, has to do with dimensions, and also has to do with archetypes, just being human. You have these different parts of you, who you want to be and who you don't want to be, that are very much an energetic piece of you. Um, and that can have uh, an effect on me as well. Um, but it, what it feels like to me, I don't know if this will help some parents get the vocabulary, is the inner stuff, and almost feels like if I'm having ailments from inner, it starts in like usually the pit of my stomach or sometimes my chest and then it kind of slowly spreads out in the body. When it's outer, it feels like a weight on me. Like it literally feels like a, a blanket or a sheet or something on top of me and there's this urge to try to push it away from me. Um, and also to when you start taking notice about, I mean, you're going, you're homeschooling, but like, was there like big time resentment or when did that kick in? Or if it, if it ever did about realizing that other kids weren't going through this? The resentment actually started the anger. I would say it was anger first really started in my preteen years and it started when I was getting medicated. So um, I probably will mention this again in future interviews, but the medication that I was on in the therapy was the best thing for me physically because I was struggling physically, but spiritually it was the worst thing. Um, what limited control I had with the spiritual just about became non-existent when um, they started putting me on medication. Um, and neuromedicine will do that. Um, so, and this is a common issue with children that have abilities. Um, luckily, I wasn't on that medication. I think I was only on medication at maybe three years. Um, but still, from a spiritual perspective, that was a very, very painful three years. And I started getting very angry. Um, and I started feeling like the victim. Um, prior to that, I was registering, I'm different. I don't like this. I don't want it. But I can't say that I felt like the victim. Um, when I was on the medication is when I started registering feeling like the victim. Um, and I would have things come and visit me and I couldn't wake myself up. I couldn't do anything about it. Um, and I would see things and totally not be able to um, cope with it, you know, versus sometimes I'd be able to walk away and my mom could calm me down for whatever reason. Then with the medicine, it's like, my brain was only working a certain way. It was working the right way for the physical life, but it wasn't working the right way for, for the spiritual part of me. We're coming close to the end here, but I did want to discuss, um, cause we're going to move into your, your teen years. 
in the next episode and the the death of your father and stuff like that but i think it would be nice because you've discussed it with me talking about what spiritually happens when you be when uh you come into your teen years and why it can feel so it can be so drastic you know spiritually physically um I remember having this discussion with you a while back and I remember it being really mind, like it opened my mind a bit. So I think the first thing that you, you know, people need to understand or parents need to understand is there are two types of intuitive children and um, neither one is uh, better or worse. It's just two different ways of approaching everything. So you have some intuitive children where they're physical and they have this huge drive within them that they've got to open up their spiritual abilities and they have to become spiritual. But then you have intuitive children that are trying desperately to get physical because the vast majority of them is functioning in the spiritual. So what happens and what that looks like in the teenage years is drastically different for those two different types of intuitive children. In this case, we're talking about children with extreme abilities. Those that have extreme abilities usually are functioning more in the spiritual than the physical. And what starts to happen is your brain is opening up ego-wise. It's starting to open up that ego where they fit in the universe, where they um, fit with others, that comparison. You also start reflecting like, why am I here? Um, your thought process is completely change um, in addition to the hormones and the chemicals in your body. You start questioning your role in the universe. Um, from an energetic standpoint though, the biggest change is that um, you don't realize it. Well, you realize it, but most parents don't realize it, is that you are always energetically protecting your child you are always connected to your child so when your child is exploring the astral or the dream world at night or dealing with spirit you will always feel that um, and you will always experience that and in a way it's almost like you're standing in front of the child so even though the child is exploring all of this you're kind of in front of the child protecting the child when you're a teenager and you start hitting those new levels of thinking where you need to start discerning for yourself what's good and bad, what's healthy and unhealthy, what you like and don't like, who you want to be and who you don't want to be. Energetically, there's a response to that, and you step away from your parents' project, uh, protection. Um, yes, they're still there, and yes, you're still connected, but you're not going with your children everywhere they go. You're no longer that wall that's kind of keeping them hidden and protected in the background. Um, and so what starts to happen is they start, and that's why for some children, it's like the floodgates open. Right away, they start dipping their toes in lower vibrations. They start experiencing um, energies and aspects that they had never run into before. And that's because you already have a certain level of discernment of what's good and bad. They don't yet. And so they need to develop that on their own. And depending on why they're here, they might immediately go towards certain vibrations or energies to deal with certain aspects or purposes or growth. That's interesting that you should say this. I think actually I talked to your mom a bit about this was I felt especially in the beginning years is that I was always in the physical clearing the path for Dominic. So he wasn't overwhelmed, right? Like I was playing, you know, making sure that we were um, in certain places or trying to talk to people beforehand or trying to make it so he wasn't so run over mm. whenever we were, having situations that didn't really work out in preschool and kindergarten because, you know, he's getting drug in all the time. But, but also on the spiritual sense, it was just so connected that I, I did. I always felt like I was 
playing, I, I was clearing everything before as best I could. So he didn't get hurt. Yeah. And, and the only reason I know is I don't mind my kids getting hurt. It's that he was getting, I mean, we've talked about this before, you know, um, the moon cycle would change. I remember, you know, it would be a full moon and he would start running a fever and be talking about feeling the weight of the world. Right. And, but not also being coherent, you know, or, or acting as not acting really like being like he was being branded right. when certain things would come by. So it was enough that the regular world, everyday things were affecting him when just stuff I, there was no way I can't control the moon. Right. Right. And, um, I, I, no, you can't. I, sorry, I can't, <laughs> I can't control what's happening in Russia right. <laughs> right. as much as I want to. Um, but then when in the spiritual sense, that's what also brought me to you is because I, I knew that as I was watching these abilities grow, 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 um, that we would hit teen years and, and that, uh, he was going to start stepping away from me, not in a bad way. I, I mean, I would assume, mm. and I wasn't going to be able to play those hands. Right. And, and for you now as, as a mother, it's going to become more strategic. Yeah. Um, and you're going to kind of be on the sidelines and you'll only play your hand if you absolutely have to. Um, and then there'll be scenarios, which is, you know, the most difficult where you can't play your hand at all because it's something that he genuinely has to go through because now and that window is him becoming aware of, like we said, everything that's healthy and unhealthy, what's good and bad, who does he want to be and who doesn't he want to be. Um, he's starting to create that paradigm um, and that has a response to the spiritual and the spiritual has a response to the physical. So they come hand in hand. So it's very, very hard when you have abilities in general, but especially the teenage years. Yeah. It's difficult to not, um, to realize that they have to do it on their own, you know, mm -hmm. and, and also that they need, they need to build up that muscle. And it's so, it makes you feel so guilty. Not that I necessarily can help in every situation, but it does make me feel guilty when I, you know, I feel like I can't help him in the, in the way that I can. And knowing that what I can do is just get the resources and the help and the knowledge and then just, you know, not make it up as I go along, but sometimes it feels like that making it up as I go along. Right. And you're letting him build those muscles. And what I can say to you as a child who's been through it is it really sucks when you're going through it and you'll have moments where you feel like no one gets you, no one understands you. Well, you'll have a lot of those moments and you'll definitely have moments where you feel like um, people have left you to hang and you're abandoned. But what I can say to you now as an adult is all those moments are the moments that let me be able to do what I do now. As you know, there's not a lot that phases me. Um, and I can stay pretty calm through intense situations. And it's all those, those moments through those, you know, my childhood, my teenage years, my young adult that have built that muscle for me to be able to do that. Um, and to be able to be a support to families that are going through the same thing. What makes you think that it didn't go the other way? Because I know you and I, I, I at least me know that I, have seen people who I know have extreme abilities, but it is turned into something else in their adult years. You know, I, I assume, I mean, my, my assumption would be having to hide it and be in the closet or denying it, or not that I want to blame parents, but like not having the outlet or validation. I mean, in my case, um, this is something me and my mom discuss about, we, well, we discuss this quite frequently. Um, 
when I was, when I became a young adult, um, I was working in the arts. So I definitely had drugs and alcohol easily. Um, but I never got lost in it, despite having years of depression and anxiety, despite leave, um, losing my dad, despite all these traumas um, that started to add up. And for me, I feel like I, well, I have memories of coming in with a very specific purpose, um, which I was always very vocal about, but I also feel like there was an energy around me that was keeping me on a very strict path. Um, and I feel very blessed because there are some children that don't have that. Um, and what you got to do is really beef up their support and really make sure that physically there are people there that'll be just as tough um, because they don't have it in the spiritual. Um, I mean, I can even remember when I was younger, like going to libraries and stuff and running my hands across different books. And sometimes my hand would literally burn if it touched certain books. And when I got older, I realized these books, they had to do with the darker parts of metaphysical. So like, I felt like, and maybe that was the blessing of being in the spiritual more than the physical is that I always had some, something on top of me, keeping me on that pathway. Um, but it also caused me a lot of stress because I also could never tell a lie. I could never, like, I had this constant feeling like I can't screw up. I'm running out of time and I can't screw up. And that was constantly going through my head as a child way up until, um, my twenties. Um, so I think it's different for every child in every situation. In my case, I think it's probably a little bit more unique, but some of these children that come in with abilities, they're like me. They've got some heavy hitter spiritual guides that just keep them on the right pathway no matter what. And they try alcohol once, they try drugs once, and it's such a traumatic experience, they'll never try it again. Um, it just keeps them on the straight and narrow and gets them to where they need to be in terms of their spiritual purpose. I have so many other questions I want to ask you. <laughs> like I, like I realized that I like didn't even talk about um, like whether your parents allowed other family members in. Actually, I want to ask that before. I, I know it's not like a, a cool ending note because this <laughs> last part was like a cool ending note, right. but I think it's kind of important that we talk about that because I think, did your parents allow family in the house? How did that, that look? My family was very, very conscientious of who was in the house and who we were around. Um, and that was primarily because of my anxiety, but um, that's also just how we function. So we didn't have a lot of family coming to us. My grandmother would come to visit us once a week and she was the only regular visitor. Um, we didn't have a lot of, well, I just didn't have a lot of friends in general, but um, we didn't do a lot of sleepovers. Um, I tried really hard to do sleepovers at other people's houses, but almost always I would have an experience and get totally freaked out and have to come home or have something really embarrassing happen, like get sick. Um, so I didn't do a lot of like visiting other friends. Now I was very, for whatever reason, I really, really loved dance. Um, and so that's the only time that I can remember as a child being able to kind of shelve everything. Like it didn't really matter how bad it got, I was going to make it to dance. Um, and so most of my social interactions came from my dance classes. Um, they really did their best to control the home environment. I mean, they even went to the extent of no TV. Um, because I was constantly freaking out about different world events. So they were convinced I was watching TV and they didn't know about it. So we got to the point where they even policed TV. And as you know, it wasn't the TV that I was getting information on different world events happening. Um, but they really tried their hardest to keep the house a very relaxed and calm, sacred place, especially when I was a child. What's your feeling on that? I always, I always, I really love having like an open home. 
like I, I, I do, I really enjoy people feeling that they could come in, like the home is open. However, uh, with everything is, um, like we've had plenty of parties and stuff like that where, you know, I can tell Dominic so conflicted, right. you know, and, you know, he'll say like, blah, blah, blah needs to leave or blah, blah, blah is making me feel really sick and I don't know why, or he's feeling shame that he wants the party to end when in actuality, he doesn't want the party to end. Hmm. And so what's your feeling on, I mean, I know there's no right or wrong answer. I was going to say, it's not even about right or wrong. There's no easy answer. So one of the hardest things as a parent is you are very aware and empathetic of the struggle your child has to go through with simple tasks, whereas other children, they can have a party and it doesn't even phase them. But for every single person that comes through the house, it's a, a big to do. Every single thing you do is a big to do. Um, and the trick is, as a parent, is starting to figure out, you know, what's the battle that's worth battling and where do you need to just be a parent and say, well, I'm sorry, this is what's going to be happening. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's something that's always going to be changing and adapting with Dominic, like as you start to move through things, and even with Eve, like as you start to move through things, depending on what they're dealing with, you may find there's a time to be more lenient and other times not to be lenient. Um, but I think it's also dependent on the child. Um, you know, I have a family where they, they're extremely um connected to their community and the community is constantly moving in and out and it was not an option whatsoever for the child not to be exposed to that um and so it became part of the muscle that you know that child had to build was being able to get almost an immunity to all these people constantly moving in and out of the house and the family moving in and out of the house um, and that was just part of his pathway. Yeah, it would have been easier and it would have gave, given him a little bit more of a break if he didn't have to um, constantly be inundated with that. But unfortunately, the family dynamic didn't allow that to happen. That's so kind of unique for every family and every child. Yeah. All right. I won't ask any more questions for now. <laughs> because we have more to do and we'll move into your teen years and your early twenties. And in the next episode, we got, Oh, this is where things get real interesting. Not that things weren't interesting in this era, but it gets real interesting. And thanks so much for doing this with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Bye.